Hello and welcome to Curiosity Taught the Cat. I'm Jack, and today we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. I threw this idea out there last time uh, on the last episode about the morning gecko, about having my partner here as my uh, second person talking, uh, but uh, she's coming in completely blind. Uh, she she only knows the name of the animal that we are talking about, uh, but she doesn't know what it looks like or know anything about it. So say hello, Adelia. Hello, Adelia. All right, so we're going to be going over uh, the pato today. That's the what we're going to be talking. Yes, of course. Um, I have the slides for starting, so if you want to start seeing what it looks like while we get started. Uh, so the pato, uh, and I know you, you like the scientific names when I'm talking about them. Yes. So the scientific name is the Parodictacus pato. The Parodictacus pato. Uh, doesn't really have any nicknames. He's so cute. They are very precious. As for Look where they the, are found. <laughs> their ears are tiny compared to their body, but we'll talk about that when we talk about what it looks like. Uh, so it stretches across equatorial Africa in a tropical rainforest from Gambia and Senegal to western Kenya. Uh, they're found in areas of thick rainforest vegetation, uh, and they can live in a variety of habitats from coastal and lowland forests to mid-altitude montane forests and can inhabit primary or secondary forest growth. Uh, they occupy forests from sea levels from sea level all the way up to over 2,000 meters in elevation. So they can live fairly high up. I have uh, no concept of 2,000 meters above that one. Uh, 2,000 meters is like well over like, it's over a mile up. Yeah. So normally, uh, piles are found in trees uh, that are 5 to 30 meters tall. And as for their appearance, uh, they come in various shades of brown to gray. Uh, as for size... The adults weigh uh, for anywhere from one to three and a half pounds. So they are <laughs> tiny. They are tiny. So the the warmer the area they're in, the smaller the potos tend to be. The 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 cooler the area, the bigger, because they need to be able to put on weight and mm -hmm. stay warm and whatnot. That makes sense. Uh, and that includes also elevations and whatnot. As for measurements, uh, their head and body measurements range from 12 to 15 inches. Uh so about a foot, uh, and their tail is about one and a half to four inches. Uh, and like I said, throughout their range, they vary regionally in body mass, size, um, color, even eye shine. Uh, what? The color that their eyes usually are. What? They like what? What do you mean? Like, like we have different color, like blue and brown but what's they can have different like sheens because it depends on um like uh, the the rods cones all that kind of stuff because things can be more reflective or less reflective eyes can be more reflective, ah, less so reflective. like how so... dogs eyes are like really reflective and ours are yeah, not yeah so there, there might be like a more green a more because i know there's the stereotypical like with um big cats like at night their eyes are like yellow mm. that it's because of the way their eyes are their eye color isn't yellow it's the eye, the how eye it's shine. reflected. Yeah, it's Got a more yellow. It. Yep. Uh, and then, as for other physical characteristics, so we talk a lot about dimorphism, sexual dimorphism in animals. Uh, the pato is one that's monomorphic. Uh, so males and females, there's no physical difference between the two. Um, hmm. They are a sexually monomorphic species. So they have long, slender bodies and limbs uh, with four limbs and hind limbs of nearly equal length. So usually on this type of animal, you usually see arms might be longer, legs might be longer. This one, it's all about the same. So like Hercules. Yes. So like a dog. Yes. Uh, whereas, because it's more of almost like a primate lemur type thing, where it's, you usually would see a difference in the length of limbs and whatnot. So they got a moist nose, uh, a dental comb, and a toilet claw. What? Yes, a toilet claw. So, with the exception of the sharpened the toilet call, uh, it's it's something similar. Um, I think I, I I will get into more about all the different things that they have. The I'll elaborate more. 
Um, he didn't tell me the structure of this. And with the exception of the sharpened toilet claw on the reduced second digit of the hind feet, all other nails are flattened. So their index finger is vestigial. And if you don't know what vestigial is, I don't think I do we've not. come across um, this at all on an episode, which I'm surprised. Vestigial means it's no longer necessary. They don't really use it anymore. Mm. So it's evolution. It's still there. Like our appendix. Yes, like an appendix. It's still there, but we don't really need it. So their index finger, they don't really need it, but it's still there. Mm. Um, the reduced second digits on the hands and feet and the uh, opposable pollux and hallux. What? So, because they're all kind of like hand like, mm. Pollocks are more handy. Hallux, Grab- are they are like more, raccoons? More like monkeys and apes. Ah. Uh, where it's everything kind of looks like a hand, but two of them are very clearly feet, two of mm. them are very clearly hands. But there's some, but the, the Pollux and Hallux are just scientific terms for them. Uh, they have an excellent grip on uh, tree supports. They are arboreal creatures. They live in trees. So they got to have like the hand like appendages to help Mm. grip and climb. Uh, So some other adaptations for their prolonged grip include highly flexible wrist and ankle joints and the uh, presence of vascular bundles in the limb vessels that allow blood circulation to contracted muscles while the animal is immobile. So they can still be holding on, not moving, but they still have great circulation Mm. throughout their, um, their hands and their joints and whatnot. Whereas we would not. Yeah, you hold on. If you hold on for so long, if you get climbers, they have to do where they have to like stop and kind of like shake mm-hmm. out their hand because they're losing all the blood in their fingers. Me trying to do one pull up. Yeah. So yes. these these guys, they have great circulation, so they can just be holding on and just sitting there. So patos also possess a scapular shield, which consists of, sin, consists of elongated spines of the cervical vertebrae that uh, extend above the contour of the animal's body. Uh, so think of it as, cause, uh, it's almost like a thicker area, thicker bone, uh, just more protection sort of thing, uh, along their back. The, and the spines are covered by thick skin and fur. Um, then patches of vibrissae are also dispersed in the area of the fur. So the scapular shield area it is believed to function in defense against predators and other patos and possibly to stimulate uh, genital secretions in mates. And there we'll get into a lot th- of words there. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of science. Um, so, and then as for what the pato eats, so the patos are primarily frugivorous, which means they, they eat fruit. Uh, they also commonly animal prey though. And plant gums. So because there is a seasonal the variation... Plants don't have teeth. and they But they chew gum, though. <laughs> because there is seasonal variation in food availability, uh, the uh, plant gums are generally consumed in dry seasons, while animal prey and fruits are more readily available during wet seasons. So potos eat fruits of the uh, genera Ficus, Musanga, Merianthus, Perinari, uh, Pseudos, Spondius, and the Uapaca. Uh, they generally eat slow-moving arthropods or insects uh, that other animals find unpalatable, such as ants, foul-smelling beetles, caterpillars with irritating spines, poisonous millipedes, and spiders. They will also eat snails, slugs, eggs, fungi, and insect larvae. Occasionally, they will kill small vertebrate vertebrate prey, such as bats or birds, though. So, although potos compete with many other species in the same niche for food, such as bush babies, uh, they have adapted to eating foods that other animals leave behind, like I've mentioned, the unpalatable insects. They have also developed comparatively strong jaws for their size to eat larger, tougher fruits and large, stale chunks of plant gum. So they also have a highly expandable stomach, allowing them to eat large quantities of food and hold up to 8% of their body weight. And we already mentioned that body weight's not a lot, but comparatively, they're, they that's can hold on lot. to a lot. Yeah, they can hold on to a lot. That's, you know, 8%. That's as if a 100-pound person eats 8 pounds of food at once. Uh, that's not happening. That's a lot of food. That's 
Yeah, that's a lot of food. That's a, that's a chihuahua of food. Yeah, nobody's eating that much food. I know most people think, oh, if you had like a steak or something. No. Biggest steak I know about is like, what, 16 ounce? And how many people can finish that? Yeah, that's not happening. Um, so because of their large stomach being able to hold all this food, it reduces the chance of predation by allowing them to eat quickly in fruiting trees with sparse vegetation and then retreat to trees with dense foliage to digest and rest. So eat a bunch at once, and then they can just go back and just digest and hang out. So they don't have to be constantly foraging. Yeah. <laughs> eat a bunch, go relax. Go find somewhere nice and relaxing to let go it nap. all digest. Exa let it go nap. So uh, how they locate insects, they locate them by scent, and they capture them with just a rapid grab of with their hands or mouths. That's all they really do. And uh, the only thing that we've really seen the index finger used for is it it's used to help grasp prey is really it. So like dogs, dew claw? Is that what it's called? A dew claw? Yeah. Probably more similar to like a dew claw, yeah. Hmm. Where it's not really doing anything at it's this point. It's not very similar to an appendix. No. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a vestigial <laughs> organ like an appendix, but... Um, then as for what eats it, uh, the main uh, anti-predator for... The, the main anti-predator strategy for potos is crypsis. So, I'll explain. So... Crypt cryptic behavior in potos includes uh, nocturnal activity, small body size, cryptic coloration, uh, using little vocal communication. It's essentially making their uh, their footprint in the world as small as possible. They so, turn into spies. So they don't even get no they don't even get noticed. That's their thing. It's they want to be uh, they this don't want to be on the radar. Operation. Yeah. They don't want to be on the radar of anything. So they use a little vocal communication. They maintain very small group sizes and they can remain immobile for extended periods of time without fatigue. So like I mentioned earlier with the good circulation, mm. they can just freeze and just hold there on a tree and not move. Mm. And they will use very slow, steady and silent locomotion or movement. They usually stay hidden in dense vegetation so as to not be detected by predators. If confronted by a predator, they will exhibit their defense posture, which consists of grasping a branch with all four limbs, tucking the head down below the shoulders before, be between the four limbs, arching the back, and presenting the scapular shield. They will then bare their teeth and repeatedly bite the arboreal support they are grasping. So kind of like showing like they're biting i could be doing this to you sort of thing mm. so spread themselves out look big look menacing show their teeth that they mean I business i can't imagine that old guy looking menacing they could be tough you don't know um if the predator does not retreat the pato will then charge forward trying to knock the predator off the branch so it's it look it's got it's a little dense it can try to knock something off a branch uh in extreme danger the pato will let go of its branch and fall to the ground. It is one of the few nocturnal prosimians that do not use leaping to escape from predators. What's a prosimian? Uh, like leap lemurs. Ah. You know, lemurs, they usually kind of like jump or they kind of like, they're very acrobatic. Mm. Patos are not. Mm. Uh, when parked infants, so parked infants, it's a parent usually will like take the baby, put it somewhere. Park it somewhere so they can go do something. So when parked infants are left alone by their mothers, the mother will apply a salivary liquid to her offspring by grooming it with her tooth comb. And then this liquid applied to the infants repels predators. And it is thought that it may possess some kind of toxin. This toxic or noxious secretion may also be used to protect adults from predation. And then some known predators of the pato are uh, African palm civets or a type of uh, cat. Yeah, um, and although the civ although the civets are primarily frugivorous, um, but they will eat patos. It's probably a situation where anything bigger than a pato and can get in the trees is going to try to eat it. It's the main known predator of the patos is the African palm mm -hmm. civet. Uh, and then as for mating, so uh, males have home ranges that overlap those of several females. So you have one male with several females in the area, uh, which usually suggests that they are polygonous. They will, they, one male will mate with as many females as he can. When things want to eat them. Yes. We need to just pump out numbers. That is the main source of uh, keeping our population going is pump out babies. When male and female potos meet, they perform courting rituals that involve licking mutual grooming with their claws and teeth 
and scent marking each other. Uh, these rituals are usually performed while both are hanging upside down from a branch. Hmm. And breeding season varies uh, with regions in potos. So potos from the central part of their range give birth between August and January so that the time of greatest fruit abundance occurs during the weaning of their babies. Got it. Yeah. So when the babies are finally starting to get off the milk, there's a bunch of fruit out there for them to get. How many babies do they have? So the I was just about to get there. So the average gestation period is about 197 days. Uh, so six and a half months, okay. around six and a half months. Average number I feel of like that's a long time for such a little animal. Well, the long, because we've, t Julie and I have talked about this. The longer a thing is in the womb, mm -hmm. the more time it has to develop. Mm -hmm. So that's why you'll see something like um, elephants. Mm -hmm. Baby elephants spend like 18 months in the womb. But when they come out, they're good. They're like ready to go. I thought it was just because they were big. Well, that and the longer you're in, the obvious, yeah. something like, um, I guess another one would be like a kangaroo. Mm -hmm. Joey's come, Joey's are come out, mm -hmm. like, or they're birthed. They're like barely a thing. Yeah. They're a little. And then they got put in the, the pouch. Then the, but they immediately go in the pouch. Because that gestation period is so little, they need time after mm -hmm. birth to get ready. Uh, So these ones, six and a half months. They're, get them as they're pretty ready to go. Yeah. So, because we'll get into, so the average number of offspring is one. Um, so the six and a half months of being pregnant, the range of the weaning age mm -hmm. is about uh, 120 to 180 days. So six and a half months in the womb and then four to six months, they're already not being weaned. They're already eating fruit. Mm. So fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And then the range time for independence. So when they finally go out on their own is six to eight months. Mm. So they're they're out pretty quickly or relatively quickly yeah. uh especially when compared to their average lifespan which is 22 years they live such a long time the thing that doesn't help that is how much of that average is captivity obviously captive ones are going to live longer ones are in they, the wild are usually lower are they a common captive animal no like zoos and whatnot or like research are, but are they a common uh, yeah a, zoo animal a, a, I don't know if these ones are con considered common zoo animals. Because I had never heard of them. I, so. I haven't either. So they might, they're probably not common zoo animals. Mm. Um, but stuff like breeding programs, research, whatnot, are they're they still endangered? kept uh, We will get there. Don't worry. That comes towards the end. I got too many questions. We end on high notes. Uh, so infants are altrical at birth, but are comparatively well-developed when compared to other primates. Um, because they have to climb to their mother's, so they're, they're born and they immediately climb to their mother's belly and cling to her. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all done without the help of the mother. Baby comes out and immediately climbs up and clings to the belly. Those instincts kick in. Yep. And so the offspring will cling to their mother's fur for the first three to eight days and are rarely carried as in like on their back mm. um, or the mother is holding them. Uh, as the infant grows, the mother will park the infant <laughs> by uh, leaving it hanging on a hidden tree or branch at night while she forages. The infant will nurse during the day while the mother sleeps. At three to four months of age, offspring will accompany the mother during foraging by riding on her back or following behind her. Offspring learn how to feed by grabbing food and prey items from their mother and examining it with kind of you we've they've seen where it's almost like very curious behavior mm -hmm. where they're holding it and they are like what looking this at thing? this thing like they are turning their head they are turning the object uh before they finally eat it because they see mom's eating it so okay i can eat it uh male offspring will stay with their mothers until they uh leave at around six months old females will sleep with their mothers until they are about eight months old and then they will inherit part of their mom's home range so usually males will go out and find their own range. They inherit the land. Females <laughs> just usually will stay in the general, this same is general my dowry. area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then some uh, behavior, family, family society stuff for them. So they're primarily solitary animals. And as I said, they are nocturnal. Mm -hmm. um, so they're solitary except for females with their young. Mm -hmm. uh, males and females will defend their home ranges uh, large enough to provide these home ranges are large enough to provide ample foraging opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. Female home ranges must be large enough to support the female and her young, and they are generally six to nine hectares in size 
and males defend larger home ranges in order to overlap with those of several females. So I said the females are six to nine hectares. Males are nine to 40 hectares. Ooh. They are significantly bigger. Yeah, that's a difference. So both males and females will aggressively defend their territories against same-sex uh, conspecifics. So against other potos. They, their range is their range. Uh, the population densities have been estimated at eight to 10 potos per square kilometer so fairly dense mm -hmm. um but they're small enough to where they can spread out a bit mm -hmm. and then as for some communication they do uh they use uh chemical cues extensively to communicate they leave urine trails and secretions from glands under their under their tail on branches to mark territory and communicate information on their reproductive state they use a toxic or nauseous noxious glandular secretion to deter predators which we talked about and the potters have this have a distinct odor that some observers have called curry like hmm. so they kind of smell like curry uh they have several vocalizations the most common being a female contact call to young that sounds like uh I'll, maybe you want to try it's it's spelled p-s-i-c yeah that that's the the most common that's the most common call that a female will usually do to her young and potos have excellent vision in low light in order to navigate and find food at night. Mm -hmm. So that's so primarily operations. So that's primarily what they're working on is smell and sight are their biggest things. So if you look at the pictures, their ears are not very big. They're not relying on hearing as much. Mm -hmm. It's going to be sight and smell mainly for them. Yes, yeah, so little ears. There's little babies. Cute. Then as for population size. Uh, they are not endangered. Ah, yeah. So on the IUCN, uh, which you may not know, is like the the worldwide official like uh, species thing. List. How that? Yes, uh, that's where we get the official like endangered, all that kind hmm. of stuff. So least concern is their population thing. So usually the scale will go um, not evaluated. Mm -hmm. So the IUCN just hasn't even looked into it. They mm -hmm. don't know. Uh, insufficient data, so they've looked into it, but they don't have enough data to know, mm -hmm. then least concern. Mm -hmm. So we're not really worried about it. It is not a species that we're going to put active resources towards because we're not really worried about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some threats they face, though, as almost every animal we've talked about, uh, it's going to be Poachers. deforestation ah! and human hunting. Those, those are going to be some of the biggest. Um, with predation, uh, like other predators... We don't see it as much just because they're pretty good at what they do. But yeah, deforestation is probably the biggest threat towards potos, which is the case with a lot of these animals that we talk about. Uh, there are a few studies that have effectively effectively documented pato population size. Um, potos and other nocturnal prosimians are impacted more severely than other arboreal primates by deforestation and human development because forests are usually cleared during the day while the potos are asleep in the trees. Oh. So that's why nocturnal ones get defected more because they don't even know what's going on. They don't have a chance to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And due to their slow locomotion and tendency to freeze when threatened, they are easily burned or chopped down with the trees, sadly. No! It, it, it's awful. Like, it, it truly is. I, I wish... Save the potos. Save them all. Stop deforestation. Is the, is the That's the, probably one of the biggest takeaways out of all the episodes is just like... Stop pollution, stop deforestation. Those are always the biggest takeaways with this section. Uh, and then I do have um, one fun fact about them. Uh, is that as frugivores, the potos are instrumental in seed dispersal. Mm. Uh, so, and we've seen, we've, I, we may have talked about this with some other animals, but the pato and animals like it are instrumental in the dispersal of like fruit bearing trees and plants. Because... They will nom, eat the nom, fruit. Nom, nom, nom. They'll eat the whole out. fruit, seeds and all. The seeds get to be in the belly for a while. The seeds get some nutrients because they're in the mm. belly. Then the potos will poop them out, and then they'll get even more nutrients. Self fertilized. It, exactly. The the seeds are already fertilized, and so say there there's a good number of uh fruit bearing trees on one side of the potos range. Mm -hmm. But there's not on the other, but the other side is where the potto nests. Mm. So the potto may eat a bunch of fruit trees over here, go back and nest, do its business, and now there's fruit trees over there in a few years. Mm. So they are instrumental Good job, in the, Yeah, it's it, it's one of those where they are very important to their ecosystem. It's one of those where they may not look it, 
But if Patos and other uh, frugivores in the area all started disappearing, now all the fruit-bearing trees are going to start disappearing. Mm. Um, but like I said, that's the only fun fact I have. Uh, we hope you like this format that we did. Uh, we'll, we're going to keep uh, experimenting, do some more as well. Um, a little more practice at it. <laughs> exa exactly. This is the first one. We'll figure it out. Uh, but we hope you enjoyed learning about the Pato. Adeli, I hope you enjoyed learning about I the Pato. I did. Uh, uh, appreciate everybody listening and everybody have a good day.